Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads Podcast, presented by Head Start Basketball. Drills and, and X's and O's are, are still important. I think coaches understand now that to develop a play, you've got to develop an understanding and an IQ. Peter Lonergan is the Director of High Performance Coach Development for Basketball Australia. Peter is an influential coach educator impacting coaching development around the world. He has been an Australian Opals assistant coach, a highly successful state director of coaching in Victoria and New South Wales, and an international clinician for FIBA. Hey, hoop heads. I wanted to take a minute to shout out our partners and friends at Dr. Dish Basketball. Their Dr. Dish shooting machines are undoubtedly the most advanced and user-friendly machines on the market. Sign up now for their virtual camp 2.0 featuring 10 days of workouts with pro trainers from the Dr. Dish family. Learn more at drdishbasketball.com and follow their incredible content at Dr. Dish B-Ball on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Mention the Hoopheads podcast and save an extra $300 on the Dr. Dish Rebel, All-Star, and CT models. Visit drdishbasketball.com for details. That's a great deal, Hoopheads. Get your Dr. Dish shooting machine today. Hi, this is Paul O'Connor, Pro Skills Basketball Columbus City Director, and you're listening to the Hoopheads podcast. If you're looking to improve your coaching, please consider joining the Hoopheads Mentorship Program. We believe that having a mentor is the best way to maximize your potential and become a transformational coach. By matching you up with one of our experienced mentors, you'll develop a one-on-one relationship that will help your coaching, your team, your program, and your mindset. The Hoopheads Mentorship Program delivers mentoring services to basketball coaches at all levels through our team of experienced head coaches. Find out more at hoopheadspod.com or shoot me an email directly, mike at hoopheadspod.com. Follow us on social media at hoopheadspod on Twitter and Instagram. And be sure to check out the Hoop Heads Podcast Network for more great basketball content. Prepare like the pros with the all-new Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Fast Draw has been the number one play diagramming software for coaches for years. You'll quickly see why Fast Model Sports has the most compelling and intuitive basketball software out there. For a limited time, Fast Model is offering new subscribers 10% off Fast Draw and Fast Scout. Just use the code SAVE10 at checkout to grab your discount, and you'll be on your way to more efficient game prep and improved communication with your team. Fast Model also has new coaching content every week on its blog, plus play and drill diagrams on its play bank. Check out the links in the show notes for more. Fast Model Sports is the best in basketball. Jot down some notes as you listen to this episode with Peter Lonergan, Director of High Performance Coach Development for Basketball Australia. Hello and welcome to the Hoop Heads Podcast. It's Mike Cleansing here with my co-host Jason Sunkel. Tonight, we are lucky enough to welcome from across the ocean, Basketball Australia's Head of High Performance Coach Development, Peter Lonergan. Peter, welcome to the Hoop Heads Pod. Thanks, Mike, and, and thanks for the opportunity to jump on. I'm, I've been a fan of the pod, so I'm looking forward to, to having, a, having a chat. Well, thank you. We appreciate the kind words. It's always good to know that there are people out there listening. We are excited that Brent Tipton, who was recently a guest on the show, has connected the two of us, and we're going to dive right in to learning a little bit more about you and your basketball life. So let's start by going back in time to when you were a kid. What are some of your earliest memories of the game of basketball? Yeah, I didn't come to basketball until, I guess, late in my teens from a small regional town in, in Australia and, you know, played cricket and a couple of football codes. And uh, it wasn't really until I uh, started following the, the local team, which featured, uh, you know, an American import and was sort of an exciting thing to go and watch that the love affair started. So... My, you know, my journey into it really didn't start till I was, you know, 17, 18. And, um, you know, fell in love with, with playing uh, and then was lucky enough to, to have some opportunities to get into get into coaching. 
teaching at a very young age and, and probably with you know, limited experience. Uh, like many, many uh, Australian players and coaches, you know, I, I sort of learnt the game, you know, watching um, tape delayed replays of, uh, of Magic and Larry and, and then Michael Jordan, um, of course, and, um, and then, you know, it evolved from there. And it's probably not, a, not an appropriate thing to say as we go through this pandemic, but, uh, you know, I really caught the basketball virus and it's taken me on a 35-year journey ever since. Who was your guy growing up? Who was the guy that you, that you liked the most to watch? Yeah, Larry, um, you know, he, he, was, he was from a small country town, you know, French Lick, and, and you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of things, that, a lot of synergies there that you can see. So, uh, yeah, really loved Larry and, and the Boston Celtics and the way they, they went about it. And, again, maybe it was the plan of the seed to be a coach later on. I just loved the unselfish and the toughness and, and, I guess, Celtics basketball of that early to mid-'80s. What was it about coaching that attracted you to want to jump into it? Obviously, as a player, it's completely different watching the NBA. You can watch it as a fan. You can play the game. But coaching takes a special kind of mindset. So what was it about the game and wanting to coach that really started you down that path? Well, uh, as a young Young man, I really admired my coaches, uh, most of which were, were volunteers, um, you know, local builders or, um, you know, local tradesmen that just wanted to help young people. And from a very young age, I can remember, you know, as a nine, ten year old, really having a strong admiration, my coaches and, and the role of the coach. And it's always, it's always something I wanted to do, whether that was in, Australian rules football or um, cricket uh, or later on in basketball, I just thought that, that coaching was really cool. Um, I thought the impact you could have on young people was something that I, I wanted to do. Um, and I think the big thing is, as my love of basketball evolved is basketball coaching, you can have a really significant impact. Um, you know, as a cricket coach and no disrespect to those guys, but, <laughs> you know, once the game... Once the game starts, you, you don't have an impact at all. Um, same about football codes where, where basketball, both practice and the games, you know, you're right there, you're, you're very close to it, you can communicate to, to players. And I just loved that you were involved in every aspect constantly rather than, you know, roll the balls out once the game starts and, and you know, hope for impact. So when you think about that ability to impact kids and then you think about the coaches that coached you when you were a player is there something that stands out that maybe a coach said to you or a coach taught you during the course of your time as a player that still sticks with you today is there anything that you can think of that is still with you that a coach said or did yeah well I guess it's a cost because I said I didn't come to basketball until very late in my teens, but I, I just uh, an unselfishness. Um, you know, as most youth sports do, really preach team and, and being unselfish and you know good at a whole and all those things. Um, I know that sounds a bit corny, but it resonated with me. Um, and you know, again, it speaks to those Celtics teams. You know, the balls flying around, extra passes. Um, you know, it, it just was a, a fun thing to be involved with. And, and I think that's been something that's, that's been a core in my coaching is making sure that we, we play with a really high level of unselfishness, um, you know, and I guess embrace the beautiful game um, in a lot of ways. How do you teach that to the players that you work with? And you think about unselfishness and you think about how do you get your team to buy into that when there's some inherent uh, <laughs> characteristics of people that there's, there's some selfishness built in. So how do you build in that unselfishness in your team? How do you get to buy, get them to buy into the team concept? What's been successful for you through the years and getting your teams to buy into that? Um, 
A great friend and mentor of mine in coaching, Bill Tomlinson, once told me, your players will be good at exactly what you want them to be good at. Um, and as a young coach, I, I really didn't understand what, what he meant, but he, he, it spoke to what you prioritise, what you value, and what you celebrate. So, um, you know, it, it is a hard thing because it's hard to, you know, you're trying to impact personalities at times, you're trying to impact style of play, all sorts of things. But if, if you celebrate an unselfish act, if you celebrate class, if you, if you highlight in your film session um, an act that maybe doesn't draw a statistic um, but has helped the team, uh, players will, will buy into that. Because you know, inherently, players are, are pleased, and they, they they know you're the person that hands out the court time, and you're the person that can manipulate how many shots and and opportunities to get. So, if they know what you value, um, you know they'll buy into it. You know, there's challenges, there, of course. If if a player, you know, is really switched on to, I've got to get my 15, 20 shots a game. Well. You know, that comes down to conversations. It comes down to film. Um, but I'm a big one. They'll be good at exactly what you want them to be good at. And you just got to make sure that you know what you do you know, on a daily basis. All right. So let me ask you a little bit about that. When you think about, as a coach, putting together your philosophy, figuring out who you are as a coach and what your team, what you want them to look like and what you do want to prioritize both on a daily basis and over the course of a season. How do you recommend or how do you think about coaches going into, let's say, a season with things that they want to focus on and then breaking it down even further? What would you say to coaches in terms of, how they break down their focus in a given practice session. In other words, I think coaches sometimes struggle with, I'm trying to make a lot of corrections or trying to fix a lot of things, or I'm, I'm not really focused on only a couple of aspects of team play. Instead, I'm just kind of all over the place. So how do you get coaches to focus in on specific things that they want their team or an individual player to be able to improve on? Yeah, I think you've got to start with the end in mind. Um, you, you've got to have great clarity yourself in, in what you, you want your team to look like and, and what you think basketball should look like. Everyone's got their, um, you know, philosophies and their, their preferences, um, you know, and that comes from mentors and influences and maybe the way you played or the way you would have liked to have played or be coached. But, you know, starting with the end in mind, this is, this is what we want to look like what our personality should be um, and then making sure your staff has got a clear picture of, of the, of the end, end game uh, and then you reverse engineer it from, from there. You know, the, the great methodology, you know, whole part whole, well, you can apply that to your philosophy as well. Uh, I think, as you said, a lot of coaches uh, build up their system of play or play uh, and they've got all their building blocks to get to the end game. But while they're doing it, they've got a clear picture in their mind that the players have no idea. You know, players aren't many coaches. They're, they're going to be compliant. They're going to do what you want to do. If you haven't outlined the vision, shown them what the vision looks like as a whole, it's going to be really hard to ever arrive at that place. So I think with the end in mind, working back, one of the big themes that, that we have with our coach development program here at BA is, is two words, more conversations. You just need to have more conversations, uh, ask more questions, and, and then say, hey, have you guys got a feel for where we're headed? And most players will be honest with you. you know, um, if they don't, then you have, to, you have to go another plan of attack. But I think that's really important that as you've got – do you see it in your mind's eye what you want to be, who you want to be, and how you want the team to play? Can you then communicate to the other people that are going to impact it, i.e. your coaches? And then when, can, collectively, can you communicate that to the players? When you first started coaching, how long did it take you to 
understand the need for having that philosophy of coaching and having that end game in mind. And clearly as coaches, we're all continuing to learn and evolve and our philosophy and the way we go about things can change over time. But oftentimes as young coaches, we just are kind of all over the place trying to figure out who we are as coaches, what, what's important to us. When do you feel like you started to develop your own philosophy where you would have been comfortable if someone had asked you, Hey, what's your philosophy of coaching where you would have been able to come up with an answer? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question because as a young coach, I was the great imitator. Um, you know, I, at one stage I was, I was Bobby Knight and we were motion and, and pressure defense and I was running on the sideline yelling and screaming. And then I evolved to Dean Smith with the, the break and, you know, pointing to the passer and, and all those things. And then as I started to work for other coaches, I was a flex coach, I was a pressure coach, all sorts of things. That wasn't a bad journey because you're learning the whole time. But I, I would say, you know, 15 years in, uh, you know, I started coaching at, at 19. You know, mi- mid-30s, I just had a feel for, for how I wanted teams to play and, and how I wanted to coach them and how I wanted relationships to to unfold. So uh, it certainly took a while. But again, I don't think that's a negative. I, I don't think you can be three or four years into your coaching and unless you're a savant like a you know a Brad Stevens or something like that and have real clarity on, on who you are as a coach and how you want to play. How do you help the coaches that you work with get to better understand themselves so that they can come up with their philosophy? And obviously we know that in the basketball world, just as you just described, coaches borrow from other coaches that they watch, that they see, whether that's in person, whether that's on television, whatever it might be. But eventually, as a coach, you have to start to decide and prioritize what's important to you and building your philosophy. So how do you convey that message to the coaches that you're working with and help them to develop their philosophy? Yeah, I tend to use a lot of questions, especially in coach development. Um, you know, you don't want to, to you know, tell people how to think. You don't want to buy a dog and bark for it. You know, you, you've got to, um, you know, communicate and, and ask questions. The, the big question is, I ask is, you know, what what do you, what do you enjoy watching? Now, is it, uh, you know, San Antonio Spurs basketball, the beautiful game? Is it is it Chris Paul, uh, pick and roll, reads and, and genius. Is it the Warriors split system? Is it European basketball? Is it, you know, the great Japanese women's Olympic team? You know, what, if, if you could, you know, have to pay to watch basketball, what would it be? So just trying to un- unlock, you know, what, what you enjoy as a coach, what, what connects and resonates with you. Um, and then the next question is, okay, how, how does that system of play fit with what you currently do? And often it's very, uh, there's no link at all because, you know, often we, we run the stuff that, that our coaches run or, or we run on the latest cool thing and, and it, it's really not our personality. So I try and talk about, what, you know, if you had a preference and you could coach any way, any style, what would it be? Now that's not always possible because of uh, of your talent and and different things, but I think it's a great starting place. You know, if you really enjoy something and and you resonate with it, well, you know, why wouldn't you teach that and communicate that to your team? I think that's one hundred percent accurate. In that, coaches need to be able to figure out who they are. They need to be able to then combine that with what their personnel is capable of doing. I know one of the things that you've talked about before is the value that coaches can find in attending other coaches practices. And you mentioned it in your last answer, when you talked about what do coaches typically run, they run the things that their coaches ran that they did as players. I know I can speak for myself in that, My very first coaching job was a JV high school job. And when I went into 
coach that team. I had played for one high school coach. I had played for one college coach. And that was pretty much my entire knowledge of what a practice should look like, what the X's and O's of basketball should look like. And so what did I do? I did those things. I did not have that exposure to other coaches, whether that was through watching video or attending practices. So just talk a little bit about why you think coaches should be attending other coaches practices as much as possible and what value they can get out of that. Yeah. That's the single best coach development activity you can undertake is, is watch other, other teams practice. Um, we all watch games because we've got a love of basketball, you know, whether that's WNBA, NBA, uh, collegiate league, Euro league, you know, we watch enough games. So you, you, you get a bit of learning out of that, but, you know, seeing the great teachers teach, um, seeing how people prioritise different things, practice structure, communication style, there's just so much to learn there. Um, and you can learn it uh, at coaches of any... Uh, you know, quick story, I was lucky enough to, to be in uh, Belgrade, Serbia for a week, um, probably about 15 years ago, and we attended practices of uh, Red Star Belgrade in the Euro League, Partizan in the Euro League, and fantastic. But of a night, we would go to youth practices in these little high school gyms and we would watch, you know, 70, 80-year-old uh, Serbian youth coaches, you know, coach U14s. Um, and often I'd come away from those practices with four or five pages of notes where I'd, I'd come away from the Euro League practice with one page not because the Euro League practice wasn't great, but it just resonated with what they, how they t teach youth basketball. And that's where I've spent most of my time. So, you know, I, I think it's just crucial that you do it. And the reality is if you ask the coach if you can come to their practice, that's a compliment to, the, to that coach. So they're going to say yes, and they're going to involve you, and they're going to give you a practice plan and, and try and help you because they, they understand how important it is. That's a great point. It's one of the things that has definitely come through our conversations here on the podcast is just how willing the basketball coaching community is to share their knowledge. And we've had, I can't even count how many coaches have said to us, Hey, you want to come out and watch a practice or Hey, if your audience wants to come out and watch a practice, just get in contact with us. Let us know if you're in the area and we'd love to have you come out and see what we're doing. And I think that there's so many different ways of going about organizing practice structure, doing player development, doing your offensive and defensive systems that if you just pigeonhole yourself into one or two philosophies and you never get outside of your comfort zone and go out and watch other coaches do what they do, then you're going to end up doing, you're end up doing your coaching a disservice because you're not going to expand your mind and your possibilities of what you can do to improve yourself as a coach and ultimately improve your players and then improve your team. So when you go and you sit at a practice and you're watching, what are some of the things that, you go into a practice looking for that you can take back to help you to improve? Are you looking for X's and O's? Are you looking for an out of bounds play? Are you looking for terminology? What are some of the things that you specifically look for when you're watching another coach's practice? Yeah, well, it's a side prison. And initially when I go to practices, uh, I look for two things and two things only drills that I can use in my practice in my home setting um, and plays, you know, out of bounds, uh, set plays, out of timeout. I thought that was, I thought that was coaching, you know, uh, get some good drills and get, get some great set plays and away you go. Um, as it evolves, um, now it's two things. It's terminology um, and how the great ones can take you know, uh, a point or a sentence that might take you 20 words to get across and they can do it in five and it's got great clarity and the players make change straight away. Um, you know, the, lucky enough to spend some time with Duke watching and, and as great as Mike Krzyzewski is, the, the thing that he does 
that resonates with me is he uses action terms and he gets to the point and he doesn't waffle. It's just do this. This is how we're going to do it. This is the focus and, and players respond. And then linked to that is interventions now. You know, how and when and why the coaches intervene in practice. What, what, you know, we all know now that the old stop start, um, you know, bring all the players in constantly to, to correct is not a great method. But, but how do you let practice flow yet still make sure you're a really high level teacher? So, you know, I'm looking at the interventions. The, the drills now, you know, I might see one and jot one down and think, yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, but it, it's more it's more now than, than the doing. Can you give us an example of an intervention that you've seen a coach do or that you've used yourself that you feel is valuable when someone who's out there listening could use with their team? Is there a specific, just an instance, maybe a story, something that you saw – that was like, ooh, that's really something that a coach could use as an intervention to be able to help their team. Yeah, we speak a lot about flight path coaching. Um, and what we mean by that is rather than stop, start, and, and get into uh, lectures and, and big speeches like Vince Lombardi, um, you know, you and your staff get across different players' flight path, and it's, you know, it's a two- or three-sentence intervention um, and, and trying to impact it that way and then move on so they can continue what they're doing. You know, one of the big things um, that we borrowed and we use it in all our clinics and, and all our coach development is from Mike Dunlap. Um, and, of course, Mike Dunlap has had tremendous success uh, collegiately and also in the NBA. But, you know, I heard him once say, you know, praise, prompt and leave. Um, as a methodology. So it's a three-part method in teaching. Um, so I might say to you, Mike, I love how you come to a jump stop at the elbow. It's great balance. There's the praise. Thing is the prompt. Hey, Mike, on that, just make sure you pivot on that outside foot so you can see the cover. And then the next part of it is leave. And what I mean by leave is, is not go and get a cappuccino or Go, go to the concession stand, but just go and coach someone else. Go and coach another part of the game. Um, and I, I just think that from an intervention point of view, it stops you repeating yourself. It, it stops you asking that terrible question. Uh, you know, you might, I might say to you, hey, Mike, I, I want you to uh, so you can see the colour. Well, for years I would say, now do you understand? Well, of course you understand. <laughs> you know, uh, it, it's a, it's a simple instruction, um, and yeah, you know, another thing that coaches do with a great, you know, I give you that, I give you that instruction three or four times. Well, you got it the first time. Why am I still labouring that point? So, I think that's a great one. I, I use that, you know, all the time. Praise, prompt, and leave. And, and again, all credit to Coach Dunlap for for that little method. I love that, and I think it speaks to. The idea as a coach that you want to be as concise with your wording as you possibly can and have something that the players can understand very, very quickly, that can be said quickly, that can be understood quickly, that might have a lot deeper concept behind it, that maybe you had to explain that concept in depth at some point. But once the players have understood that concept now they just need to in the course of a practice setting need to be reminded of that concept so if you can come up with something that is descriptive that is short that is concise that's something that i think makes a huge difference in the efficiency of practices i know that for myself this is something that i have not always been very good at it's something that i still i think struggle with today when i'm coaching is I tend to be one who sees something and then I want to do that old school methodology that you described, Peter. I want to bring the players in and I want to describe what happened and what I think should have happened. And in the meantime, I've spent 30 seconds or a minute giving that speech and I probably only had the player's attention for five or 10 seconds and I probably didn't have everybody's attention for any of that time. So 
it's a challenge, but I think it's something that coaches have to be really intentional about is the terminology and the language that they build with their team so that the communication can be efficient. If you don't build that language and that terminology with your team, I think it's a struggle to accomplish what you're describing. Would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. And, and we're all guilty of it. And it, it comes from a good place because we, we've got this information. We think we can help. We think we can create change and, and, and really help young players. So it's coming from a good place. Um, but yeah, I, I think all of us are evolving. You know, we talk a lot about the power of three. You know, praise, prompt, lead is a power of three. How do you, how do you correct a jump shot? We'll come up with three things that, you, that all of a sudden it can just become action words. It, it doesn't mean that you, that you don't teach in detail. You know, that's done in different settings now. And at times you do need to stop and bring them in and, and, and talk to them, uh, as a group. Uh, but yeah, if you can stick to the power of three, and I think too, if you can have honesty in the staff, um, you know, our under 19 men's national team coach, Darren Perry, does a great job where he'll talk to his staff, okay, I'm going to present this information. And as soon as he feels they're going into lecture mode and whatever else, he just politely says, no, that's not what we want. We need to be more concise in our messaging. So the staff talks about what the messaging is and how to deliver it. And it's not trying to restrict people's um, individuality and their teaching points and whatever else, but it's just a really commitment to allow the players to play more, stand less, um, and be efficient in, in the communication. And I do think it's really important that those conversations are taking place off the practice floor prior to practice and that the coaching staff is being intentional about what they're sharing and that they're all on the same page. Because when they are, as you said, it allows for the players to spend more time doing what they came there to do, which is to practice as opposed to standing and listening. And when the coaching staff is efficient, the players are more efficient, the practice is more efficient, and ultimately you're going to get more out of what it is that you're doing. That being said, I want to circle back to – youth basketball and I know you've spent a great deal of your career in youth basketball and a lot of what I've done on the basketball floor as a coach through my camps that I've been running for a long time is with youth players and so I have a particular passion for youth basketball so I wanted to ask you about your philosophy of what youth basketball should look like in terms of a practice setting and what are some of the things that when you're working with a youth coach, what are the key points that you try to get, get across to those youth coaches so that they make sure that their kids, that they're experiencing a positive environment when they're with that coach? Yeah, well, you led perfectly into it. Is, is are they creating a positive learning environment? And positive doesn't mean we've got cheerleaders on the sideline and we're telling everyone they're doing a great job. You know, kids get it. They understand that it's a learning environment, it's a competitive environment. But, but you know, is the energy in the room positive? Is, is the energy in the practice gym geared to improvement? Um, so, you know, the first thing is we talk about long-term athlete development, LTAD. Um, you know, that's got to be the foundation of any youth coach. Now, we know the high school coach or the youth club coach wants to win. And competition is not a dirty word, but, you know, that's not the foundation. At the pro game, you know, winning is the foundation. You know, that, that's, that's what we're in the business to do. But so long-term athlete development, positive, you know, learning environment. In terms of practice structure, you know, I said for years that 20% of total practice time should be on shooting. Um, I said that probably for 20 years and I'm wrong. I think more like 30% of your total practice time should be on shooting. Now, that doesn't mean, you know, just shooting drills. Um, you know, we talk about the four phases of shooting. Uh, you've got your form. You've got, you've got your kinetics, sorry. So what, what's it look like in terms of your body movement and your footwork? Then you've got your form, 
then repetition when he gets shots up and the last thing situational. So contested shooting, shooting off your cut, shooting out of out of um, what happens in a game. So th there are a few points and of course uh, internationally the use of small sided games is now massive. You know, there's less what we would call block drills and there's more things that look like games. You know, there's constraints there, we're teaching, we're not just rolling the balls out, but I think in the youth, we have to do more things that look like basketball. Uh, I think sometimes we get in the habit of, of running these drills and really if you ask the players, what, you know, what do you think, why do you think we're running this, wouldn't be able to give you the answer because they, they, they haven't made the link between drill and game. How important do you think from a really early age – putting kids in those small sided games, putting them into game situations helps them to be able to be better decision makers because obviously basketball is a dynamic game. It's a game that you can't predict what's going to happen. Ultimately a player's success or failure is going to be built upon. Yes, they have to have a certain level of skill, but ultimately the players who are better decision makers on the floor are going to end up being more successful. So at those younger ages, how do you help kids to be able to make better decisions? So you put them into a small sided game and they're going to make errors, obviously in judgment at times. So how do you, as the coach guide their decision-making and help them to better understand how to see the game so that as they continue to progress, and grow and improve and get older, that they have those decision-making skills. They have that foundation to build on. Yeah, I, I think is the minute they walk in the door, you, you want to have them, you know, in, in a small-sided game environment. Now, obviously, there needs to be more um, plat what I call platform coaching to start. So they need to be able to pivot. They need to be able to jump, stop, dribble, right hand, left hand, whatever else. But uh, you know, one of the great learnings in this is w once my children started playing, um, you know, on um, what their, their youth coaches and their youth program did with them, um, you know, some of it was great. And I thought, that's really good. I'm, I'm going to incorporate that. I'm going to talk about that more. But some of it wasn't so great. And I thought, well, that's a good learning too. Um, I think early on, we know success is a huge part of, of learning and development. So, you know, I think early on small side of games should be a numerical advantage where you really provide the opportunity for young players to have some success. You know, um, so play three on two games rather than three on three games. Um, you know, play a little bit of a two on one because, you know, we know that the game's a series of two on one situations. Um, so we need to practice, practice those. So, um, you know, it needs to be more guided early. They don't have the conceptual understanding of what the game looks like. They just remove a player. You know, play three on two, and, and the simple goal is just, you know, get it to the open player, and if you're open, shoot it. Uh, they'll start to understand the, the nuances of that and how to engage defenders and this, that, and the other. But, um, yeah, I, I think that's a great method early, is play out a numerical advantage and disadvantage. So there's a a really good opportunity uh, for, for young players to have success. If they have success, they'll buy into the learning. Yeah, that makes a ton of sense to me. I like the idea of that advantage-disadvantage from a standpoint of it makes the decision, as you described, pretty clear. Pass it to the open player, and if you're the open player, take the shot. And so you're kind of narrowing down the decisions that those players have to make where eventually – those reads and those things are going to become more subtle and they're going to be harder to recognize. But by building that foundation in early through that advantage, disadvantage, you're giving them the opportunity to develop their decision-making skills, but in an environment where the number of decisions has been at least somewhat controlled or reduced so that they can make those decisions and have an opportunity to make mistakes and figure it out. And by doing that, you're also doing it in a fun environment, right? Because you're getting them an opportunity to be able to score and to have success and be able to hopefully 
get some shots to go in the basket, which is probably the reason why we all started. <laughs> this is probably the reason why we all started playing in the first place, right? To watch the ball go through, uh, go through the basket. That's what we, what we all live for. And I know you have some thoughts about how important form shooting is, and, and you maybe do it a little differently than, than some coaches traditionally have. Can you talk a little bit about what your philosophy is behind form shooting and why you think it's such an important part of player development? Yeah, well, I think, you know, if you think back when you were playing and probably early in your coaching, form shooting has been such a big part of how we, you know, develop shooting. Um, you know, the traditional form shooting drills are also some of the most mind-numbing, boring drills in the history of the sport. You know, standing underneath um, with the ball in one hand, uh, lifting up into a follow-through, yeah, it, it's got some value and... and I understand it. I'm not saying that we throw those sort of drills uh, out the window, but as we try and we try more intentional coaching and more applied coaching, um, you know, we can expand form. Form doesn't have to be standing two foot from the basket and trying to get all squishes. You know, we can incorporate some pivoting because that's what's going to happen in the game. It doesn't have to be fast. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, 14, 16 foot from the basket. But, you know, just have the kids pivot before they do the form drill or, or just have them spin it out and, and step one, two into it. So now, rather than just develop the follow through and the arm action, we're dealing with we're developing the relationship. You know, one of the big things with form for me is it just separates the parts too much and then we don't bring them back together until the kids are in a drill and they're trying to shoot at speed. So that, you know, we've separated into all these robotic parts um, and then 10 minutes they're in a drill and we're asking them to rip off the curl cut, catch it on the one, two, lift into the shot pocket, release high, follow through. You know, I think that's, it's too big a jump. So, you know, adding some variation, um, one makes it more game-like and more intentional, but two, you know, we, we had a situation in a, in a program I was involved with where we charted, we started to stack uh, form shooting. We didn't tell the players, but we we're, were just, we're just uh, charting it and statting it. In form, our team was shooting just on 70%. I'm talking form drills, you know, a metre from the basket, you know, with no pressure, no defense and whatever, it was less than 70%. Not because they weren't testing sound, not because they weren't good players, but they put no value on it at all. Right. It was mind-numbing. It was just mind-numbing. You know, we would put six minutes on the clock and, and we would say, hey, get your form. Here we go. You know, the coaches would go and chat about the practice plan, guys who are shooting their form shooting. No one's engaged in it. No one's intentional about it. That you know. So you know, we tried to add some elements to to make it one a bit more fun, but but two, make it look like basketball. Yeah, it's amazing how things have changed in terms of making sure that what you're doing actually looks like the game. And it seems like it would be so naturally intuitive that it should have always been that way. But we know that. It hasn't been that way, especially at the youth level where you have players who are just developing their skills. And as you said, there has to be some baseline level of skill development that the players have to have in order to be able to execute some of the more advanced skills that are necessary. But when we think about what makes the game fun, when we think about introducing some variability, when we think about incorporating – things are going to make it look more like the game. We've certainly evolved in that way when it comes to our way that we structure practice. When you start thinking about how to make the game fun for youth players, I've always said that one of the things that I try to do as a coach when I'm working with youth players is to make sure that the environment that I create is one that makes the kids that participate with me, whether that's on a team in a practice, whether they come to a camp, whether they go to a clinic, 
that it's going to be fun so that they want to come back and they want to play more basketball. So if you were talking to a coach who was going to coach a group of, let's say, 10-year-olds, what advice would you have for them to make sure that they made their practice environments fun for the players and yet still provide a quality learning environment? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. My, my son just turned 10 uh, maybe three weeks ago. He had his first year of organized basketball this year. Um, and so I would go to the practice. Um, he had um, terrific youth coaches. But, of course, the first thing that he and his friends would ask the coach the minute practice started is, when do we play? We're we going to scrimmage. When do we get to play? When do we get to play? Because um, that's what every nine and ten year old wants to do. They want to play. They understand practice is important, and yeah, they want to learn. But they're not all that interested in drills. You know, when it comes down to it, they want to play. Now, what we've got to convince them, and what we've got to do is, is we're going to play all the time. But playing can be one on one, two on two, three on three, or five on five. You know, so. Yeah, we're not probably going to play five on five today because strictly known in my little youth team, I might only have eight players um, or I've players that tour at a school camp. So we can't play five and five, but we're going to play the whole time. Uh, and I think the, the concept of, of teach it, drill it, play it, again, the power of three, the teach it, drill it, play it is really powerful with that age and then right through to, you know, 16, 17 year olds. So we're going to teach the skill. Um, you know, we're going to give you the tools that hopefully have some success. Then we're going to drill it. Now, you know, we're going to practice it so you get some repetition, you get the physical feel of it, um, and you get to, to execute it in a safe environment. In other words, it doesn't matter if you miss that shot or you don't execute that card or, or whatever else. And then you're going to play it. Now, the cards have a significant impact in teaching it. That's the coach's time almost. The, that diminishes a little bit when you get to drill it, where the coach is doing more guided learning and guided discovery with the player. And I think the big thing that now that is, is, is when you get to play it, the coach, you, <laughs> you've got to keep your mouth shut for the most part. You know, it's more about encouragement, celebrating successes, because um, you can't coach through the whole three stages. If you do coach heavily through the whole three stages, it's not playing in the player's mind. So that, that's a, a little power three method that we try and espouse. Get drill it, play it. I like that. I think it makes a ton of sense when you talk about what's going to make the experience the best one for the players. We've all watched, unfortunately, youth games where you have – coaches on the sideline who are constantly yelling out decisions that they want players to make in real time out on the floor. And I think when I look at what makes a good youth coach, obviously it comes down to be able to create that type of practice environment like we've been talking about. But I also think that there's some parent education when it comes to what a good youth coach should look like on the sidelines during an actual game. I think people sometimes feel like they should see someone running up and down the sideline, yelling and screaming and giving all kinds of instruction. Whereas I think you can make a case that a good youth coach is going to behave slightly differently than what we might see from a professional coach that we watch on TV. So in your mind, if you were going to give advice to, a coach who's coaching youth basketball of what they should be doing in a game. Now that's provided that they've done what they should be doing during practice, but what does a good youth coach in your mind look like on the sidelines of a game? Yeah. Well, firstly, they, they've got a coach from their personalities. So, you know, they, they don't need to try and be Greg Popovich on the sideline because they're not Greg Popovich. So they've got a coach from their personality. Um, secondly, you know, your job is, is to not be a distraction. Um, and I know early in my coaching, uh, I was a distraction. I was running up and down the side and I was, you know, um, waving my hands in the air. I was yelling at officials. 
um, you know, I was, you know, barking out, drive it, shoot it, pass it, you know, all those terrible things. Um, and then... Initially, I was... Um, I was uh, really insulted, but then I realised what, what the person said was, was right. So, and I think the last thing is it's, there can't be a, a, a vast separation from practice to the game. You can't behave and have a certain method, method and, and philosophy in practice and then be a completely different person in, in, in the game. So that's what I would say. And in terms of parents, you know, you just got to verbalise that. This is how I'm going to approach it. This is what I think is the best way to do this. Are you tired of slipping and sliding on the court and sticky sheets just aren't giving you grip? Grip Spritz solves this problem without having to lick your hand to clean your shoes. Grip Spritz is used by countless AAU, high school and college programs, semi-pro teams, as well as NCAA athletes and G League players. Unlike other products, Grip Spritz has solutions for individual players, not just entire teams. We've used Grip Spritz at our Head Start basketball camps and players love it. To keep you and your team from slipping and sliding, visit gripspritz.net to learn more. I think one of the things that I always point to when I think about how we can make the game of basketball better, I think by educating parents, which is always a challenge and it goes along with coach education. But I think if parents had a better understanding of the why behind coaching methodology and not that every parent is going to necessarily be interested in that. But I think if we share sort of the why behind what we're doing, I think it's going to make for a better experience for those parents, but also for their players and for coaches. And certainly that's a challenge and it's not an easy thing to do, but if we can help people to understand that there are other ways besides, as you said, running up and down the sideline, waving your arms and screaming all kinds of instructions that probably the players can't process or utilize in any meaningful way anyway, that we'd, we'd end up with a much better situation for, for young players. I know there's a story out there that, you know, would you want somebody coming to your job and screaming at you and telling you what to do every second from behind your shoulder. And we think about what we do to kids who are six, seven, eight years old, trying to learn the game. And it's just a parent in the stands just yelling things at them when we know mostly they're yelling, shoot it, but nonetheless, they're just yelling things. And it's just, I don't know. It's, it's somewhat, you know, you, sometimes you go to those games and it's easy to get discouraged that, man, are we, are we doing what we need to do? And um, I, I think that, you know, the better educated we can make coaches and the better educated we can make parents, I think the better environment we're going to be able to create for our players. Yeah, I, I agree. And I was worked at a club in in uh, Melbourne uh, in the mid two thousands, and and we had a lot of youth teams. We had about forty youth teams as part of the program, and for the under twelves, we would have a parent clinic at the start of the year, where uh, we'd have the teams out on the floor with their team coaches running a practice geared around skill development, concept development, small sided games et cetera, et cetera. And then we would have uh, myself and another senior coach uh, explain the drills, explain the terminology, explain why the coaches were doing certain things as it was happening. So the player, the parents, sorry, were watching and then they were getting to understand this is why we do this. This is, this is why we prioritise this as opposed to this. This is why we don't play zone because you, you can see how it impacts their skill. Now, I'm not suggesting for a minute we didn't have any issues. <laughs> uh, of course we did. But what it did is at least provided some information to the parents um, and allowed the, the coaches to, to feel they could just coach the kids rather than be second-guessing them. So that, that was you know, time well spent. It wasn't perfect, but it certainly was a good investment. Yeah, absolutely. I can see where making sure the parents understood the why behind what was happening was going to pay off. And as you said, I'm sure it wasn't perfect and nothing, no system ever is. But I think if we can continue to be able to sort of pull back that curtain on what good coaching looks like, 
and more people out there understand it, it's going to help not only youth basketball, but it would help all youth sports if people just were able to have a better grasp and a better understanding of what that long-term athlete development model looks like that you talked about earlier and what their kids should be getting, what their kids should be seeing, how they should be being coached at whatever their stage of development is. And then ultimately it ends up making the game better for everybody. I wanted to talk to you a little bit about your role with Australia basketball. Just talk a little bit about what your, what your title means and what it is that you actually do on a day-to-day basis for Australian basketball. Yeah, well, it's like all modern business, you know, the, the titles are often a lot fancier and uh, <laughs> in the reality. And I think this is my third, I've been in the job nearly five years, my third title. And the, I think the, the titles get cooler every time and make me sound <laughs> far more important than they are, but the job hasn't changed. So yeah, look, it's, it's trying to impact coaches. Um, our model here is a little bit different than North America in the sense that, you know, probably in the high 80% of basketball coaches in this country are volunteers. Um, you know, even though we have a, a school basketball uh, system, um, it's not as entrenched as it is in North America, for example. So it's mostly club and associations and, and those people work in a bank during the day and then they go and run their team practices, you know, in the afternoon and evening. So um, because they're not getting paid, we need to pay them in a different way. And, and that's through support and education and development and resources. Um, so, and that's from, you know, uh, youth coaches um, right through to, you know, emerging uh, pro coaches and, and people that coach our junior national team. So uh, we have a system of courses, um, you know, formal courses, but more so, you know, our aim is to have, 40 to 50 coaches clinics uh, nationally a year that are free that people can just go and share information. Um, You know, we try and share as much uh, resources and develop as many resources as we can. Um, And so that's in in a nutshell. It's, uh, you know, as I always say, it's certainly better than a real job, you know, just to be able to, you know, spend time with coaches, talk coaching, talk basketball, watch practices, give feedback, um, so it's, uh, yeah, it, it's a fun role and we're really fortunate that, that Basketball Australia continues to resource it because as you know, you know, developing coaches doesn't have a commercial return, you know, it doesn't put money in the, in the bank, but it's got a long-term, you know, return. So it's, um, you know, we're in the investment, the investment business and, and I'm glad that, that, you know, my employer and our federation, Will is willing to continue to invest. Absolutely. What are when you're out in the field talking to coaches? What are some of the common things that they're asking about, or what's something that seems to be a theme that you hear from coaches that they want to know more of? What kind of information are they looking for in the clinics? Is there one or two things that no matter where you go, they almost always are asking about? Hey, I want to learn more about this or that is there something that fits that description yeah i think the two things and we've touched on a lot here the two two things is decision making you know i think the sports evolved you know while drills and and x's and o's are are still important i think um you know coaches understand now that to develop a play you've got to develop an understanding and an iq so you know decision making small-sided games you know, probably the most common question when it comes to small-sided games is, but how do you teach it out of it? Like we understand they're going to learn by doing and, and learn by discovery, but but does it, does it limit your ability to teach? So, you know, we try and unpack that a little bit. And pleasingly, the other one is shooting. You know, every coach wants to know, you know, and I'm certainly not a guru in that field, but, every coach wants to know how can we impact shooting? You know, my team only shoots at this percentage. You know, we shoot a lot in practice. What am I doing the right thing? You know, should we be doing it differently? Should we be doing contested shooting? So, you know, those, those two are the main, you know, questions and talking point, I think. All right. Let me ask you one more follow-up question with 
shooting and then we'll dive into some more of the things that you've been able to do in your career. If you were going to design a practice or a series of practices to help a team improve their shooting, what in your mind would that look like? So you just mentioned a couple of different things. We talked a little bit about form shooting, shooting earlier. We talked about being able to get reps in. Then we're talking about situational or contested shots. What would the breakdown look like in terms of, I don't know if you want to break it down by minutes, reps, however you want to structure it, but just in your mind, if you could put together what would be an ideal development opportunity for a team to be able to improve across the board as shooters, what would that look like? Yeah, well, again, you know, those four um, themes, you know, developing, you know, kinetics. So in other words, you know, how do they move their body? How do they connect the pieces? How do they, how do we make it, you know, a one fluid motion rather than a clunky series of mechanical motions, Um, you know, form, you know, are we really having an impact on how the ball comes out of their hand? Um, You know, their follow through, are they holding the ball right? Is there, guide hand coming off um, once we've got that, you know, getting some reps and then into, you know, the more situational stuff. So I, I guess I would warm up with the kinetics. You know, we, I see all these warm ups and practices and, and they're not linked to basketball. We've got to do, as I said, we will do more things that look like basketball. So rather than just jog up and down the court and do high knees and, you know, all sorts of twisting and turning and whatever else, See if you can get some movements that look like the jump shot. See if you can get some movements that look like basketball in the warm up. Um, go straight into to form. Um, then leave shooting for a period of time. You know, when I talk about you know thirty percent of total practice time being shooting, it's it's not the first thirty percent of practice. It's not the first you know twenty minutes of your hour and a half session. Um, you know. Uh, out of the form, the first thing you want to do when you come out of form shooting is get into a small-sided game um, because form's not fun and form doesn't look like the game and, and you want to continue to do that. Um, so I, I just think making sure that you got four windows in your practice, um, maybe all separated, um, that they understand, one, that shooting is important to you, it's important to the game. Um, and it doesn't become, okay, now we're shooting. I think too often, you know, coaches, it's almost like they define, we're going to have this one period of practice where we shoot it. Well, you know, we should be shooting it all the time um, and it should be sprinkled through our practice when we're fresh, when we're fatigued, when we're frustrated, when we, you know, all, all those sort of things. Um, and, you know, people always talk about finishing with playing, especially with youth teams. You know, I want to finish shooting. You know, I want to start practice talking about shooting and I want to finish practice talking about shooting. I think it's a great point of sprinkling it in at different points during the practice. I think typically what you see with coaches is they have a set way they like to structure their practices. So maybe the shooting's always at the beginning or maybe it's always at the end and they don't vary that up. And I could see the value. And as you said, when you start out practice and everybody's fresh, that's one feel for shooting. And then maybe you do it at the end, a different day, and your body feels a little bit, little bit different after you've practiced for an hour, an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half, and then you're getting to your shooting at that point. So I think there's a lot of value there. I think there's value in that variability, and that's what's really going to create better shooters. Because as we know, clearly you have to get your reps in, but each shot that you take in a game – is coming off a different piece of footwork, a different movement out on the floor. There's uh, the word you use kinetics is different each time, depending on what the footwork is and where you're coming from and how you're using a screen or are you shooting off the dribble or whatever it might be. And to be able to get that variability into your shooting to me, seems like a no brainer. If you can figure out a way as a coach to, to vary up what you do so that you're getting players, the reps they need and also giving them game-like conditions to make, as you've said numerous times, to make practice look more like the games. And that, to me, is is really what it's all about. Basketball Australia, how important has the success of the men's national team at the Olympics 
been in continuing to popularize the sport of basketball in Australia? Yeah, it's been it's been huge. Um, you know, basketball is a big sport in in Australia, but you know we have a number of other more traditional sports, I guess, um, that have been part of the the Australian psyche for a long time. You know, cricket we mentioned, and you know, we have multiple uh, football codes here. Um, so basketball is always desperately trying to fight for airtime and media and whatever else and. Um, you know, the, not just the fact that, you know, the team was able to win our first medal at senior competition at that level, but the way they did it, um, you know, it's, it's hard not to, to have a really strong affinity and, and love for the way Paddy Mills goes about it. Um, and, you know, the group plays with a great personality. Um, so, yeah, it's been huge. We're sort of riding the wave and, and making sure that we can, um, you know, we can make the most of, of the the great energy that 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 performance has, has sort of brought to the sport. What's something that Basketball Australia you feel is doing really well right now that's helping to improve the game? What do you what do you see as being the strengths of the organization at this point? I, I think there's a really strong commitment and a long-term commitment to, to player and coach development. And I guess that's a bit of a biased uh, answer because that's the area <laughs> that, that, I'm, that I'm in. But, you know, as I said, you know, the player and coach development, that that's the, um, you know, that's an investment piece. It, it's not a, it's not a return piece in terms of, you know, money in the bank and being able to do different things, you know, so, Sometimes the the pressures of finance and and whatever else make uh, organisations make certain decisions that that aren't about developing the sport and developing players and and things like that. So I, I think that's a big one. You know, I'm, we have our centre of excellence program uh, here in Canberra, um, you know, which is completely focused on the development of the next generation of of national team players, both boomers and, and opals. Um, and I think the other thing that, that our organization does really well is, is trying to have an impact and, and, and have a presence at all level of the sport. It's not just pro level or Olympic teams. It's, you know, okay, how can we develop the small clubs? How can we support those volunteer coaches, the the referees that do it for five dollars fifty a game to to help out in the rec leagues and and, and things like that? I, I think there's a really strong uh, connection between community basketball and and right up to the elite. What's something you feel like could be done better, or something you'd like to see get a little bit more emphasis? so that you could have an impact in, in a, maybe a, a new area? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting interesting question. I, I just think, um, you know, it's always – communication is always a challenge because you've got so many multifaceted – you know, it's a multifaceted environment, you know, from, from small clubs to, to major pro clubs and, you know, the National Federation. So I know, you know, the BA is working really hard on – on, I guess, that connectivity, you know, whether that's through social media, whether that's through platforms that, that allow people to have great access to information um, and be more efficient in the way that we can share information and help people that are helping the sport. I think that's the ongoing challenge. We've talked a lot about how you and Basketball Australia through the clinics through your teaching, through outreach that you're trying to pour into coaches to improve the coaching profession. For you yourself, when you want to grow and improve, who do you look to? What resources do you go to when you think about improving yourself as a coach, improving yourself as a clinician, growing in your particular role so that you can be even of more value to the coaches that you're serving, what do you do to grow as a professional coach? I think twofold answer. I think the first one is the power of mentors and the importance of mentors. Um, you know, I've been fortunate to to 
um, you know, have three or four mentors over a long period of, of time. Um, you know, I just spoke to to one of those mentors who's, who's now in La Crosse, Wisconsin, you know, last week and just, you know, picked his brain about a few things. And I think staying connected with those mentors and just ringing up and asking questions. And, you know, what coaches are like, you ask them one question and they give you 14 answers. <laughs> um, but that's a good thing. You know, you take notes and then you, you do it. So that's the first thing, you know, people that I've coached with or for, that had an impact as a young coach. Um, you know, I try and stay connected with with those people a lot. And I, I think the, one of the most pleasing things of, of social media and, and the digital age is the opportunity to do this, you know. Um, Absolutely. You know, and just share information and, you know, people can, can have a negative connotation around social media, but, you know, Twitter's a great connector. Um, you know, I've got... Um, you know, really valuable coaching relationships with people that I've never dealt with in, in 3D. I've never physically been in the same room as them, but, you know, sharing information and asking them questions, reading, um, you know, that that's what I try and do. I guess the third one would be I read. Uh, you know, I try and have a discipline around, um, you know, reading, you know, 15 to 20 books a year. Um, um, and and staying with that discipline because, you know, when you get busy, the first thing that goes is that. But, you know, that's an investment piece too. So I, I would think that would be the three big things that, that I try and latch on to. I'm, I'm lucky. Um, I can walk out any stage and watch our Centre of Excellence and uh, the NBA Global Academy practice. So I can get my my fix and my feel of, <laughs> of watching that, you know, on a daily basis if I want to. Absolutely. You mentioned reading, you mentioned 15 to 20 books a year. Is there a book that stands out that you've read in the last year or two as one that if coaches out there haven't read it, that you recommend they pick up? Uh, yeah, Kevin Eastman, you know, why the best of the best is, um, you know, I think Kevin Eastman, we're lucky enough to have him out here there's some clinics and he's just a great thinker. His clarity of thought is, is great. So that's one. Why, why the best uh, are the best. Um, another one, Pete Carroll, uh, win forever. Uh, I just think he's, he's one of the most innovative thinkers uh, in sport. And obviously that's not a sport we have here in Australia in, in, in um, you know, NFL gridiron, but those two, um, you know, I have, probably 20 books in my office here that I try and have a discipline to read 20 minutes a day where I just open up from at a page and try and read my 30 pages. And, you know, they're my go-tos at the moment. The Kevin Eastman book, I think, speaks to our earlier conversation. I think one of the things that he does really, really well, and it comes across very clearly in that book, is he's able to take very complex concepts and ideas and boil them down to their very simplest terms where when I read that book, I came away from that just blown away by the simplicity of his words. And yet they were just very, very powerful. And I think it's a great, great read for any coach who's out there. Why the best of the best by Kevin Eastman. I can completely and completely back you on that one. I have not read win forever by Pete Carroll. So I'm going to have to pick that one up and put that on my, put that on my list to, to start reading when you're doing all those things. So when you're talking with mentors, when you're reading, when you're watching practices, do you have a particular method that you use for writing things down and keeping track of some of the things that you learn so that you can then go back to you. Do you use computer files? Do you have a notebook? Do you have, how do you go about organizing the information that you gather from these various sources so that you can refer back to it and start to incorporate it into what you do? Cause it's one thing to hear it. It's another thing to actually put it into practice. So how do you go about organizing your thoughts and the things you're learning as a coach? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a notebook person. Um, you know, I, I, you know I'm, I'm taking notes as we're having this conversation, um, you know, because you can always learn. And, and really, it's just a plain notebook. Um, and I just write 
things that resonate and whatever else. The the way I try and embed it is uh, in my early pre basketball life, I was a journalist, so I, um, I I try and write articles. So if I if I watch a practice or I have a discussion with someone, you know, and I think oh, there's some really good points there, I, I think we should share that. Um, you know, we have a, a coach's site for Basketball Australia and, and many of the articles are just from conversations that I've had with terrific coaches or leaders or, or, you know, conversations about the game or watching a practice. So, yeah, I just take a lot of notes um, and then try and turn those notes into documents and, and articles, which is more for me about embedding the learning Right. But it also gives you an opportunity to share. Yeah, no question. That's a really interesting way of thinking about it as a former journalist. And I've never heard anybody say that they take their information that they've learned and put it into articles. I've had a lot of people talk about journaling and writing things down and circling back and how that helps to embed the learning by actually writing it with pen and paper as opposed to typing it on a computer. But I have not ever had anybody, Peter, tell me that they turn it into articles. So that's really interesting. And I'm sure that's, a, again, another way for you to challenge your thinking and to get you to clarify what it is that you've learned. Because one of the things that I always, I think, struggle with is I'll read something, I'll learn something, I'll be excited about that something, and maybe I'll even write it down. But really, the next step is to be able to implement that in my life or in my coaching or in my systems that I use for whatever it is that I may be reading about or learning about. And it's one thing to hear it or read it. It's another thing to implement it. I think that's something that if you're a coach, if you can figure out a way to learn from some of the methods that you've talked about, some of the things that we've share tonight on the podcast or coaches have their own ways of being able to learn. But the important thing is that not just that you get it inside your brain, but that you also actually implement it and put it into your life. And that's where you're really starting to lock uh, and unlock true value. I want to ask you one more question before we wrap up, because I know we're pushing up on our scheduled time. I want to be respectful of your time. So my final question for you is when you think about what you get to do every day, and you look ahead in the next year or two, what's the biggest challenge that you have in front of you? And then when you think about what you get to do on a daily basis, what brings you the most joy about your job and what you get to do? So your biggest challenge and your biggest joy. Yeah, well, the first thing, and I mentioned it before, I wake up every day and say, hey, this is better than a real job. (laughs) um, so you know it's gratitude is a big one you know making sure that you 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 understand that you know it's a a good opportunity i I think the biggest challenge will you know is in the pandemic world at the moment is i think the only way that you can develop coaches is i call it the john candy method planes trains and automobiles (laughs) there you go you you've you've got to be out there you've got to do it in 3d you know, you, you've got to visit people, you've got to attend their practice, you've got to, you know, you've got to be in their environment to do it. And so that that remains a challenge. You know, moving around freely still remains a challenge. Hopefully, you know, hopefully the, um, you know, things change here soon and we can we can do that. Um, so that that's the biggest challenge is just staying committed and, and trying to find ways to, to spend time in people's environment rather than being, you know, sitting in a in a you know a palace on top of the hill, making edicts and and being the all knowing guru. Um, the the thing that excites me at the moment is, and it's a byproduct of a very terrible time, is is the the absolute hunger and thirst for learning and and sharing of information. Now, you know, um, you know, we've all done a million zooms and a million pods and whatever else, but there's a real energy around growth and and getting better. Um, and I think once we get back to competitive basketball, that'll be a really positive environment. So that probably how it sum that up. I agree. I think what's interesting is that we now have the ability to connect with people, as you said, through Zooms, through virtual coaching clinics, through podcasts. And when we eventually get back to where we can be 
in person and coaches can travel and we can have in-person clinics and some of the things that we know help to develop. It's going to be great to have the best of both worlds. I guess we've learned something through the pandemic that I'm not sure that we would have without it when it comes to the ability to connect with people virtually, whether that's through, again, the virtual coaching clinics, whether that's through podcasts, whether that's through any other type of method, technology, things that we've been able to do here with, uh, with technology during, during, during this time that has been a challenge, but I think it's also brought some things that are going to improve the coaching profession moving forward. So before we wrap up, Peter, I want to give you an opportunity to share how people can connect with you, how they can find out more about what you're doing with basketball, Australia, whether you want to share social media, email, website, whatever you feel comfortable with sharing. And then after you do that, I'll jump back in and wrap things up. All right. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, well, we have our Basketball Australia coaches site where we try and put clinic videos and clinic notes, articles uh, on, you know, a couple, three times a week. So that's coach.basketball.net.au is that site. Um uh, as I said, I think Twitter's a, a, a great way to share information and, and my Twitter is at Lono610. So that's at L-O-N-O, the numeral 610. Um, and I try and share as much in, on that as I can. And so they're the, probably the two ways to do it. And, and I love to engage. And, um, you know, we anyone who wants to engage through either of those sites, I'm, I'm, you know, love to, to share information and, and pick your brains on what you guys think as well. So that's probably the best way to do it. Perfect. Peter, we cannot thank you enough for taking the time out of your schedule to join us from halfway around the world. Really appreciate your time to everyone out there. Thanks for listening. And we will catch you on our next episode. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Hoop Heads podcast presented by Head Start Basketball.